Our scripture reading today comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 15, and I am reading the NRSV version, which is the standard version that I use. Listen for the voice of God. In the spring of, of the year, the time can, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. He, it was reported, this is Bathsheba's daughter, Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David went, sent word to Job, send me Uriah the Hittite, and jo Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to, to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in, in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will do no such thing. Then David said to, to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in, in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. Here ends the reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I do owe you a bit of an apology with uh, some of my mispronunciation and things. Um, that's always the secret to reading scripture text. If you don't know how to say it, just pretend you do. But it was a little rough today, but that's okay. Uh, this sermon, uh, this scripture passage, I should say, is one of the most difficult, I think, to preach on. And one of the reasons that it's difficult is there is no good news in this passage. Um, usually the intent of a message is to tie in the good news that you can change, you can grow, you can adapt, you can uh, be whatever you might need to be. But this passage doesn't round out in a way that we can put a little bow on top of it. You will get a bit of relief for that next week. Next week, scripture continues this story and it kind of wraps it up a little bit. But another reason this passage is hard to talk about is because how we have treated it and misinterpreted it over the years. We're going to delve into this text a little bit more in depth than I usually do. And um, I do think it's helpful for us to have more of a study mindset towards this passage rather than a devotional mindset. Uh, this passage may not be so much about what does it mean to you, but what is the text saying? Another item of business before we really get into this text that I have to warn you about is that we are talking and dealing with issues that are very sensitive. Some of these issues may resonate quite deeply with individuals who will hear this message. And again, um, we'll get to those issues here shortly, but I want you to know that I am aware of this, and I believe that's important, um, that you know I'm aware, but also that I believe it's something we need to talk about. 
this scripture passage is a narrative text, and narrative texts are not ones that we preach from a lot. It, they're not easy to preach from, and partly because, like this text, it doesn't get resolved till next week. So we're left somewhere in the middle of this story and trying to ascertain a moral to talk about. And that's one of the issues in the interpretation of this passage. We rush to the end of the story to try to get the moral, to the big point. And it's, this is one of those passages that's not uncommon for people to do. And um, so we're, we're going to need to go a little bit line by line, at least for the beginning of the passage, to really get into what this is trying to show us. So start with verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when king go, kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. So right away here, we're introduced to a problem in the story. And that problem is David stayed home and sent his armies out to war. This is not what a king is supposed to do. Now, we're not told why David stay home. Let's say maybe there's a valid reason, an old war injury or something, or maybe he needed to govern or oversee a particular project in the city of Jerusalem. However, I don't think we can say those things. One, they're not in the text. And secondly, it doesn't work with David's actions going forward. The, those statements, those questions, or possibilities paint a very generous view of David in a story that is not generous of David. And so this is the first problem. And this first problem is that David is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. A good king, like I said, is in a, in a field with his armies. And this is one of the things that David was celebrated for at the beginning of his reign, that he was with his men, he was protecting you, he was doing the things that needed to be done. When David doesn't do what he's supposed to be doing, that's when the problems really start to open up. Verse 2 and 3. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, and wife of Uriah the Hittite. So now we're getting started into the big problem. And um, this is the reason I don't think David stayed at home for a war injury. David went up on the roof to look out and walk around. Now, it's assuming, we, we have to talk about his reasons for doing that, but I'll come back to that. But when he looked out, he saw a woman bathing, saw she was very beautiful. And this is where interpretation starts to go crazy because people start asking questions. Why was she up on her roof bathing? Uh, was she trying to be noticed by the king? And this led to people viewing Bathsheba as a temptress that she was there that day trying to tempt King David. And this only works in, in a couple of ways. One is you have to have a very low view of women, that their existence is only to be there as temptation for men. So that's one issue. The other is you must have, in my opinion, a low understanding of men, that men can't control their impulses, whatever those impulses might be, and that makes women bad for men. Or three, you have to ignore the cultural uh, aspects of the day. And what I mean by this, it was not uncommon for people to bathe on their roof. You have to remember it's a hot, arid environment. They're in a city with very little area that could be private. And the roof is above everybody else. So it, it is a place to be private. Okay, so you could go up there and bathe. It would be cooler because think about having like a little awning or something on your roof to, to keep shade. You'd bathe under that. Here's the thing. You can't, uh, you can't say King David just walked around his roof for no reason when that's the common uh, social thing is that people would bathe on their roofs. And the king's palace, where the king lives, is going to be taller than everybody else's. So 
I would argue David was probably being a voyeur. But again, that's not really in the text. But you have to look at it and go, well, Bathsheba is doing something that's completely normal. David is the one that is probably not. So all that Bathsheba did was go and take a shower. Not only did she take a shower, we know who, who she is exactly. She's known by her father's name, which is, is culturally what should happen, but that also implies that uh, her father has a good name. And she's known by her husband, who also, as, and as we see, is a good person. So what the picture really is, is of a woman who is going about her daily business doing the right thing. Verse 4 picks up. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and lay, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then he returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. David notices and sends for her. And the text makes clear, and I'm jumping ahead of a little part, and I'll come back. But the text makes clear she was purifying herself after her period. Now, that may kind of seem like a throwaway and awkward statement, um, especially how religious people tend to treat anything regarding human sexuality or reproduction. But I think it's important to note because she was doing the appropriate things to take care of herself. Uh, ancient Israel had all sorts of rules around menstruation and how women were supposed to handle themselves. During menstruation, they were unclean and then they were supposed to make themselves clean afterwards. I mean, there's just there's all sorts of things with that. Um, I point this out because she is, she, she's just doing normal stuff. She's at the grocery store. Uh, she is just doing her normal routine and activity. She's doing the right thing. And, and I think that's why that line is in there. Now I did jump ahead to that, but let's step back for a moment because in verse four, there is kind of a throwaway statement and he lay with her. Now I, I know and I've heard people interpreting this saying that Bathsheba willingly gave herself to David, but I wanna, I wanna point out what's happening in the text here and that is Bathsheba is raped. David raped her. A everything else we've heard, uh, every uh, interpretation that, I, that we often grow up with have attempted to clean this up and excuse David's behavior by blaming Bathsheba. Or, you know, and this is some ways worse to me, somehow claiming it's part of God's divine plan because we end up with Solomon, right? And by extension, this is how we end up with Jesus. You can probably guess I don't agree with how this text has been handled in that regard. Because here's the question, who has the willpower to absolutely reject a king? You know, in the ancient world, women were primarily seen as objects. And unfortunately, that happens far too often today as well. I doubt that Bathsheba would have had the strength or the power to deny David anything. We see an abuse of power here, a power imbalance. But not only that, we see a very real person who is raped. Someone who was created by God, someone who is doing the best they can to live a good life in the normal established patterns of their day. And then yet somehow the church has seemed to take delight over the last however many hundred years interpreting someone else's pains, Bathsheba's, as either God's plan or that she was asking for it. This text goes on and moves from rape to then David trying to entrap Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to thinking that it was his baby or, and then right after this, to murder. Calling all of this anything else is an affront to the two people who are good people in this text, Bathsheba and Uriah. Remember, I said this is not a good news text. I've been around far too many church people and religious people who like to clean up the Bible. Uh, often these are the same people who claim to me that they believe the Bible in black and white, but you can't clean this up. We'll discover what happens 
in the future next week. And But one thing is absolutely clear, if you know the story of David, David and Israel is never the same again. And it's all because David raped someone. Let's call it for what it is. As Christians, we need to learn to be more honest about what is in our scripture text. And the reason I, I go for that is because I've watched far too many Christians run to the cross for grace with no repentance because they look at a text like this and they remember that from Sunday school that David is a man after God's own heart. And so, so we use that to cover up the sin. We mishandle the text. We mishandle our theology in regarding to the text just so that we can pretend so we, we do things like this and then get to say that hated quote, boys will be boys. You know, that's, that's just, it's just such a stupid line. I mean, that line of reasoning has no place or activity in who God has called us to be. Not only should this test make us be more honest about scripture, I believe it should have an effect on who we are today, how we pay attention to what happens around us. When someone says something inappropriate happened to them at work or at the church. The church, unfortunately, has been a place where things like misogyny and abuse run rampant and unchecked. And the fact of the matter is this scripture passage forces us to look at ourselves and look at our culture and realize we cannot protect those who, who abuse others. We can't do that and still call ourselves Christian. I'm not saying, you know, people can't make mistakes and there isn't grace and all that stuff. We'll go to that next week. But what I am saying is it has no place in our faith no place in our lives, and it separates people from experiencing the love of God. And it completely destroys our witness. Think about that this week.